gendered lens right now. Um, and we want to uh, uncover opportunities for fruitful and powerful collaboration between uh, Jewish and Muslim feminists, not all of which are necessarily, so that you don't have to be a woman, of course, to be a feminist. Uh, we all happen to be women here. Uh, so uh, opportunities and as well as challenges and concerns, we want to name those, think about where uh, our interests, visions align, intertangle, cross each other, all of those things. Um, and I understand we have maybe some high school students in the audience, and I just want to give them a special welcome. Uh, I know that um, younger people, millennials uh, and Gen Z, are less likely to embrace the term feminist. Um, and so I'm always really excited to have younger people uh, meet and think about feminism, what it is, and what feminists are and look like. Okay, so um, I'm going to just introduce our panelists. I'm Ariel Levitas. I'm a research fellow at the Hartman Institute. Uh, and with us today is Samar Kakab. She is executive director of a research accelerator at the University of Chicago supporting multidisciplinary and complex research initiatives across the university and affiliated national labs. She also manages uh, University of Chicago's Big Ideas Generator. She received her JD from the Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law, and before that she studied at Oxford, focusing on the intersections of law, economics, and philosophy. Uh, to her right is Avital, Shizuk Goldschmidt, I, know, I can't get all the names, I'm really trying here, is a widely published journalist. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times Salon, Tablet, and The Forward, and she is a frequent contributor to her RS. Avital is an adjunct professor of journalism at Yeshiva University Stern College for Women, and in her spare time, she does pastoral work alongside her husband, Rabbi Benjamin Goldschmidt. And Irfana Anvar is, uh, recently worked at the Institute for Inclusive Security, where she increased the capacity of women leaders in Pakistan to enhance peace and security and take an active part in countering violent extremism in their country. In the US, she has worked to represent women <coughs> in matters of humanitarian-based immigration law. Irfana was the director of the Family Law Division at Parama Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights, and she has worked for over 10 years on issues of interfaith dialogue, violence, and gender in Muslim communities. So just a quick word about our format. So I'm sort of both moderating and a panelist, so I'll be jumping back and forth between both of those roles. Um, but I did want people to know that um, we really co-constructed these questions uh, before uh, the panel today. And so uh, we have selected a few questions uh, just to get the conversation started amongst ourselves. Um, and uh, at the end, maybe for the, ooh, the last uh, 15 minutes or so, we're going to have time for questions from the audience. Um, so uh, Summer's going to start us off with the first question. Why should Muslim and Jewish leadership, both male and female, care about gender equity now? How does the sense of a crisis and emergency make questions of gender equity for our religious leadership more or less pressing? Where should questions of gender equity stand in the list of priorities for our communities? Um, so I think that was one of the things I was going to start off with is the fact that feminism is a really difficult subject for people to talk about, particularly in faith communities. Um, it's often seen as it's, uh, people are uncomfortable about it. Women are uncomfortable about it. Men are uncomfortable about it. And so one of the, the things that I've found in my experiences is that if you reframe the questions and what we bring um, forward and what we prioritize when we even speak about feminism, it's easier to address that question. And so the, some of the questions that come to my mind when we speak about this and when we talk about our faith communities and the role of feminism and gender equity um, in them is the following question. So what are our values as members of faith communities? Um, what is at risk when we don't speak about feminism or gender equity? And uh, who is in the tent and how do we see them when we speak about feminism and gender? Um, so the first, I mean, I think the values are really simple. And it's something that we actually don't think a lot about when we talk about things like reproductive justice, childcare, things that affect women, and particularly in the ways in which women are marginalized. Um, but the values we share are pretty common. Um, safety, security, health, access to economic opportunity. Um, you know, I think these are very, both American values, but they're also values that are reinforced by our particular faith tradition. Um, and I think rather than seeing feminism as a zero-sum game about you know, 
about gender oppression or masculinity or femininity, I think one of the things we do ourselves a disservice when we talk about the marginalization of women, we don't talk about the way it also impacts men and the way that men's, uh, when masculinity is diminished when we speak about that. And so uh, one of the things that when we, when we talk about a word like patriarchy, which is really uncomfortable, we're not really talking about the constraints that puts on masculinity, on leadership, on how men see themselves and how narrow and we, that gets defined. So I think one of the ways that we can reframe how we speak about and the prioritization of, femini of feminism is for men to actually see themselves as an integral part of that conversation. Um, and then in terms of what is at risk. So what is at risk is the 52% of our congregations start seeing themselves as not finding relevancy within the synagogue, within the mosque. Um, how, how is leadership within Muslim and Jewish communities? How are we responding to those things? And then finally, um, you know, I think we'll have much more time to talk about the ideas of intersectionality and the various ways in which um, different aspects of women's identities interplay and both compound and also complicate the way we experience things. Um, so. <clears throat> I guess I'll continue. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the crisis as I see it today in today's current political atmosphere is, as I see it in my community and the Orthodox Jewish community, is that there's a certain lowering of standards um, with which we talk about all minorities, uh, which we talk about and eventually which are legislated on. Um, and that is legislation, both political and religious. Um, there's a trickle down effect and I see it everywhere. Um, speaking of that 52% lacking uh, relevancy in our synagogues and mosques, I see it everywhere. It starts as jokes, it starts as casual conversation and then it becomes more and more serious. I see this in the girls high schools I speak at with the questions that the young women are asking in the Orthodox Jewish community about their future as women who care. I see this in uh, rabbinic lectures, rabbinic conferences that I attend. Um, and I see this in the most telling of all, which is uh, conversations during synagogue, um, during and after, during the reception, Kiddush. I hear more and more with this election season um, rhetoric that has never been acceptable before within our community, or slowly we were moving out of that, slowly we were pushing ourselves to be something bigger. And suddenly I feel like there is this regression and we see this regression across the country, but particularly in faith communities where we adhere to religious roles, it is especially troubling. Great, well, thank you so much for setting up this question. I think uh, my colleagues here have touched upon some really important issues, but so you know, why should we care about equity or women's leadership? It's essentially, the, the, what I would say to this is because that's what's going to move us, because that's really what's effective. I really think it's important to start thinking about women's inclusion, not just because it's the right thing to do, and I think most of us here would agree it's the right thing to do, because we're 50% of the population. And, but it's also the effective thing to do. We, as, as various communities, Muslim and Jewish, we have an agenda, especially right now, as we're moving into these difficult times, we want the needle to shift on these really important issues. And those issues will not shift unless we work together. And, I, and, and that's what's really important. When we look at some really important topics like even domestic violence laws, the reason domestic violence laws actually exist wasn't because policymakers realized it was the right thing. Now I think most people would agree that we should have laws against domestic violence. But the change came when we convinced lawmakers it was the effective thing to do because we were losing money as a country because of domestic violence. And I don't want to go into that, but it, it, it's actually a really interesting um, case study. And when we look at entrenched problems <coughs> in other countries of South Africa or Ireland or Liberia, it was when women came to the peace table that when, that, when, that's when peace was possible. So recently I was in Pakistan just last year and I was um, leading a security mapping exercise with women. So the point was why, why should women be included in national level talks? And when women talk about security, it's very different. So women bring different information to the table. So we're, as women in, in our communities, they'll talk about what does it mean to be safe? And they're talking about their family. They're talking about human security because that's their life. They walk in different bodies. So without that information, we're not going to shift the needle on some of the larger topics that we all care about. So it's the right thing to do, but it's also now the effective thing to do. And I just think that we, 
we can't move forward without it. And I think at this stage in our, you know, in our, in our communities and where we are politically, um, it's almost low hanging fruit that we, 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 we need to care about it really because it matters. And I think there's an opportunity to Irfana's point also is when we talk about um, these issues, like, like taking something like security. I mean, you often, particularly mm -hmm. Jewish and Muslim communities, we talk about borders, we talk about national security, but we don't talk about the lived realities of what it means to keep families safe, what it means to keep individuals yeah. safe in the societies and the communities that we live in. And so I think there's, there's much more than economic opportunity, um, particularly as members of faith traditions, is that we have this opportunity, given the current political crisis that's uh, impending uh, within the United States in itself, of how do we see ourselves as Muslims and Jewish? How do we live out our values and think about the way that security actually impacts the lives mm -hmm. of not just women, but all of society, of families, of men, of women, and the ways that we are, we're missing the boat on that when we don't include feminism and gender equity into these other conversations. And I, I just want to build on this idea that gender equity, well, it's about justice for sure, but it's also just not like a nice little bow no. that we put, you know, when we sort of achieved a, a feeling of safety. Um, and it is about being effective. And I just want to, there's a woman, her name is Judith Bommel, and she's a historian of the Holocaust. And she looks at uh, the Holocaust, the experience of Jews through a gendered lens. And what does she find when she reads narratives? And I'm sorry, I just went straight to the Holocaust. So it's one of the things that's like looms over our conversation. Yeah. Um, she found that um, Jewish women were more likely to advocate for immigration than Jewish men were, just in aggregate as a whole. And why was that? It's because who we are affects what we see, right? And the lived experiences of Jewish women who were uh, in shops, trying to do their, go about their daily routines, they saw a different face of Europe than their husbands who had um, maybe worked in professional settings, many of whom were now unemployed and retreated to the home front. They saw, they saw something different out in the world and they came to a different conclusion about what the best response would be. And so if we want to have effective leadership, I think that our communities, uh, would, would, would best be served by having lots of different eyes on the ground and lots of different experiences that will lead us to draw different conclusions about the best way to negotiate the way forward. And gender equity is an important piece of that puzzle. Um, so, and I also, I also want to throw out the idea, and I, I don't know to what extent you guys see this, but the myth of like what a leader is, the hero leader, mm -hmm. and how leadership, um, what our ideas of leadership look like. And I know, Arfana, you're you know, working in, in areas of security. Um, and I'm just wondering to sort of what extent, um, you know, who makes people feel safe? What's the kind of leadership we think we can trust? And then what's the kind of leadership that actually leads to effective resolution or effectively addressing really hard questions, if you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Uh, and, and it, I think when it comes to peace, security, or any of these really um, sensitive topics that communities face, oftentimes we find that women can, they, they, they play several roles, right? So they can create buy-in when there's buy-in needed. So when you're talking about policy making, that you see that women are able to navigate, and it's not just that women are more peaceful, or that they're better people, right? I don't want to fall into that sort of that stereotype, and we have plenty of examples when you have women in highly patriarchal uh, systems, they tend to take on the same oppressive um, characteristics at time. But it's, it's really a matter of what women bring and that they bring different information. And they also oftentimes bring buy-in and they're able to navigate between different communities, different parties. And we've seen that like something like that had happened in Ireland where women were able to talk to different parties and to, to create buy-in. So it's a different form of leadership um, because it's different lived experiences. So I think that it ends up being a very, it ends up being complementary. And there's yeah. also this, this aspect of, it, it, you, you raise this, is that by bringing in a diversity of thought, you bring in mm -hmm. information, but then also you kind of unleash this possibility for masculinity and male leadership. And I think what we see right now is our very narrow definitions of power. I think many uh, Jewish and Muslim communities follow these traditional pathways to power, of what it looks like, uh, you know, there's kind of this hierarchical structure, these things that exist, and everyone has to operate underneath them. 
And by bringing in women and bringing in diversity within our leadership structures, you, you deconstruct the ways that we even see leadership within our communities. And so that empowers not just women, it also empowers men. Okay, so have a, a rosy kind of picture a little bit maybe <laughs> of the, the bonds maybe or some shared approaches which women often utilize possibly. I don't, we are always talking like not essentially about women and men. Um, so I also wanna make sure that we talk about um, this notion of sisterhood, mm -hmm. what women are supposed to share and the promises and pitfalls of that idea. Um, and I'm curious if, uh, the panelists here have any special expectations of connection, alliance, solidarity with women across different groups and why or why not that might be and how the intersectional lens, which is very important right now in the conversation about feminists, sort of how that complicates um, sisterhood and, mm -hmm. and enriches sisterhood. Um, and I think that's on it. Sure, you know, absolutely. So, you know, when I think about a sisterhood, um, there's two things that I really look for. And one of them is a safe space to really indulge in all our weaknesses as the, the, the things that we find difficult about our own tradition and our, our religious traditions and how our lived experiences and then the solidarity that you gain from sisterhood in order to do the broader work. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been such a mixed bag. It's been a sisterhood and a, it's been a blessing, but it's also been a source of great frustration. And, you know, and I think it's a great way that you put that question that we have the expectations and the pitfalls. So working with women of my faith has been very, very important to sit down and to really just talk about what is difficult about our tradition. That's something that's not easy to do, especially outside of this group. And, you know, and I've worked with women of other, of other faiths and also broadly my career is really being the very secular, liberal, nonprofit world. And what I expect out of, with, with broadly as, as in sisterhood is to be accepted both fully as a feminist, but also fully as a practicing, believing Muslim woman and all that it entails, including my reliance on predominantly male scholarship, right? I, that's really important and that's very difficult. So working in a very secular field, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys as well. It's that, you know, it's like faith is instrumentalized. Like faith is really interesting right now. So let's work with Muslim women or Jewish women because we have a goal. And how do we reach that goal? We can work with women who come from these faiths. And, but there is an inherent distrust of faith in and of itself, right? And that's what destroys any level of his sisterhood. So, and, and, and I think it's really important for, for, for any group sisterhood to survive to understand that the term feminism, the F word, <laughs> is very problematic in our communities. It has been used as a war cry, war cry, right? Like to be aggressive against certain communities, to maybe even go to war against certain countries, to save Muslim women from Muslim men. I mean, there, 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 there is that, uh, and then that, that continues to exist. So that will destroy any form of sisterhood. Um, and there needs to be an understanding that the changes that we want to see, we have a different methodology of change. We have a whole tradition and what change entails, and it's going to look different for different communities. Um, so that's why, to a great extent, the F word has failed in our broader communities, because I think that, you know, it, it's, it feels like that, that our faith is being instrumentalized. Now, working with women of other faiths has been really wonderful, because that's where we can put God consciousness and spirituality into the into the conversation. Um, it's been very healing. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it later. I have experienced some good good outcomes working with women of other faiths, but but there are also a lot of pitfalls. And I think that's where you know I think that's the conversation that's really important to have. But that you know we, we talk about this broadly speaking when we work with people of other faiths. We don't want to use the renegades of each other faith against each other, right? And that's something that is a real issue when it comes to faith-based dialogue, that it's so easy to work with people of another faith who reaffirm and validate the fears that already exist. So you have the cover, oh, we're talking to, it's a faith-based conversation, but really what you're doing is just, just, you know, just confirming the stereotypes. And, I th and, and that's been a real challenge. I was just Googling faith, feminism, Muslim, Jewish women. And there are a couple of names that come up over and over again. And I think that specifically when we're talking about working as women, there are people within our, both of our traditions that have made it 
their niche and their agenda to break down, have inherent biases both with religion and the communities. And I think it's, that's one major pitfall that I see um, in working together. So I think it's really important. So what's important there is to, whenever we're, we're working with women or people of another faith, is to look at community. How rooted are they in community? Um, are, they, are they an outlier? And to apply the same values that we want, as Summer was talking about. It's not, so it's, it may be low hanging fruit to work with some people, but to, to really think of what are their values? Where are they coming from? What community do they belong to? And how, in some ways, how accepted they are. So we can critique our communities, but we critique our own communities with a level of respect and with the ultimate agenda of improving that. Do our partners do the same thing? Or are they just confirming our stereotypes? So I, you know, as a, well, having worked over the last 10 years in you know, these fields, I've, I've seen that as a major pitfall. So um, I would love to hear from the two of you as well. I mean, I think directly in response to that is, is one of the things, and, and I'm, I'm probably going to take it to a more negative place, is that one of the challenges I have when working with, you know, you spoke of multiple feminisms as a you know, feminist of color and as a Muslim feminist, is when I work with my partners from other faith communities or from other backgrounds, um, one of the things that I find is that there's this imposition of values, right? I think we all, we have different prioritization of what matters for feminists. For some women, it might be leadership roles. For some women, it might just be able to have uh, a full-time job and to be able to have economic security. And those are two very different things and they represent two very different communities and needs. And so I think, you know, on this issue about renegades and who we put forward from different communities when we speak of feminism, one of the questions I don't think is asked often enough is what are the needs of the particular women of that community? And what does, and allowing them to say, this is what matters to me and this is how I want to live my life, rather than me coming in as a Western woman and saying, you know, what matters to you is X, Y, Z. Do we, are we actually affording women the opportunity to say what matters to them? And until we are asking that question, and that question is not centering every one of our conversations, I think we're having irrelevant conversations. We're not actually speaking to the needs of women, and uh, we're not allowing different women to define their feminism differently. Thank you. I 100% agree. Um, I think that the promises of sisterhood are pretty obvious, right? Um, there is a place of intersectionality where my Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem is on the same shelf as my Talmud. But, um, and there is certainly a lot of room intellectually to learn from different, uh, from different traditions and different schools of thought, uh, which I try to apply personally. But the pitfalls, as you so beautifully put, uh, as I see in the Jewish community between groups is that there is a lot of tension between different groups of quote unquote feminists where, you know, different communities needs different, radically different things. So what a reformed female rabbi is fighting for is, is, is centuries away from the average ultra-Orthodox woman living in Brooklyn, New York. Right? They may not even want the same thing. They don't want the same thing, right? And I write about this a lot. I have written about this a lot. You know, when in, in the Jewish community, there's a lot of you know debate about even let's say tefillin, you know, women wearing tefillin. Well, in one community, that's really important. The phylacteries is a mm -hmm. certain symbolic, you know, and I definitely understand that. But you know, in the in the circles that I generally go in the women aren't even thinking about that. They're thinking about going to college. We're, we're talking about a different century of living. Um, so, and, and that has been really difficult because I, I guess I, I try to be in both worlds um, and, and I feel like there are two different languages being spoken and I'm sure this is mm -hmm. something that you see very often as well. Um, you know, within the more uh, orthodox traditionalist world, there's a very interesting uh, movement that is growing uh, really gaining ground, especially in Israel, in the ultra-Orthodox community, there's this, uh, an idea of feminists who wear wigs. Um, these are Orthodox women who are fighting for uh, what they, how they uh, define equality, which is a different definition than what the average secular woman in Tel Aviv have, might define equality. Uh, and there should be a certain amount of respect given to those women as well and to their definition of how that is uh, defined. So that, that I think is a major pitfall. I would love to see if there's a place for these two uh, groups of women to join. I don't know yet at this point, I'm pretty pessimistic about that, uh, that uh, 
juncture of, of forces, but I would, I would love to see that happen. Yeah. Um, as a journalist, I have uh, writing very often about Orthodox women's issues. One of the most amazing and most of the most heartening moments has been uh, the letters I get from religious Muslim women. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I write about certain apologetics and how they're taught to Orthodox girls in school, uh, things that we kind of grew up with and were fed, you know, you're like a, you know, you're, you're like a, a jewel and a jewel must be kept in a box and must be kept safe away. Uh, and the Muslim women who write to me and say, wow, that's, I grew up with this. This is, you're writing my life. Um, it has been extremely uh, inspiring to see what, uh, what a connection there is between religious women across faith boundaries. Um, just to see the responses and to see Muslim feminist blogs and the ones that you cited writing about it, that has been really exciting as a, as a writer. And I really would wonder and would love to see what more could be done in, uh, between religious women, women who really share a lot of values. Maybe there is room for sisterhood, I would argue, between deeply religious women mm-hmm. of different faiths rather than you know across denominations within one faith. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that what you're talking about with when women, religious women come together in a space and talk about what really matters to them, there's a lot of commonality there. And unfortunately, I think particularly, and I can speak to the experience, experience of being a Muslim woman in the United States, is when we are spoken about, we are spoken about in one of two ways. Either that we are oppressed by, the, by our men or about what we wear or choose not to wear. And rather than, I would love to see a conversation about feminism and women and one that includes Muslim women, where both of those things aren't even on the table because quite frankly, that's not what is a priority for most Muslim women in America. Most Muslim women in America are trying to make, they're they're trying to get economic security. Uh, Racism is an issue for many Muslim women in America. Uh, Health insurance, things like these, things that are very universal are what matters and what makes the lives of women better, more equal and more fair. Um, Rather than speaking about the things that actually don't significantly impact our lives, I think we, it's really important how we prioritize what matters to our communities. And what's fascinating to me is, so my own research, I look at like liberal Jewish women, so identify as spiritual, maybe not religious. Um, and um, the scholars that I really rely on to help me do a lot of like heavy theoretical lifting are people who, um, they are women of uh, Muslim heritage who are looking at Muslim women, and I have to tell you that the the same questions of like agency within tradition that come up mm. in you know Egypt or Pakistan, they come up. I promise you, mm. right here today in, in New York City and lots of places where you know Jewish women feminists who might think that they're kind of you know possibly even saviors of other kinds of mm-hmm. women, you know, they're also navigating the same questions, and I think that. Um, uh, Muslim feminist scholars have actually done an amazing job of advancing the vocabulary and our like theoretical capacity for grappling with the questions that are raised there. So that's that that's I think that's that's a rosy kind of sisterhood <laughs> promise. And I think in terms of pitfalls, um, you know, one thing about the American Jewish community is I don't think we've done our our language for diversity is. Um, even just amongst our own community, like we're kind of blind to like who's in the American Jewish community sometimes um, and our own sort of racial and ethnic diversity. And we don't necessarily have an advanced vocabulary to talk to people who don't share that kind of the same heritage. And um, my sense is that a lot of American Jewish women would like to be in in these conversations and there's a lot of sort of shame maybe about that we're not as enlightened maybe as we want to be or think we should be and how those kinds of you know how our our um our inadequacies might show themselves when we engage in those kinds of conversations like how we'll be shown to sort of not maybe be as advanced in our thinking as we like to hold ourselves to be and i think that you know I think that um, I identify as white. Um, so for white Jewish women who, you know, other Jewish women who share that identity, what it would mean to sort of take more risks in terms of being partners in conversations with people that we don't often have time, you know, a chance to talk to and, and, and make mistakes 
and wow, I, I said a dumb thing. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I have to rethink that um, to, to take more of those risks upon ourselves. Yeah, and I, and I think another major pitfall when it comes, especially when you're speaking to Muslim women in various communities is that it, it's, it's, it's leaving the men behind in some ways, right? I mean, I think that it's very important to talk about a sisterhood. But when we think about early wave feminism, it was really about women quoting women. It was about women leading women. And I think it was needed, right? And that model, we know that it does, just doesn't work in various communities. And I think it's very hard for a lot of Muslim women to talk about a sisterhood for that reason because it, there's a real fear that we have to move together on these issues. And, you know, and I think we've also learned from like the, the early, the, the failures of early feminism. So I think that when we talk about our sisterhood, women can't be consumers, can't be the only consumers of feminism as Summer was saying. So how do we connect that to the work that we do broadly? And how do we start leading? I mean, I think part, what I want to see Muslim women, Jewish women, women in general do is not just talk about the problems that we have in our institutions, right? I have a lot of issues with the way our institutions are organized. I, I don't want to just talk, but I want to show. So I, what I want to see out of Sisterhood is major community initiatives being led by women. So a program like MLI, for example, could, doesn't have to, it could, it could come from a predominantly Muslim, a, a feminist uh, space, like women leading the community. So if the Sisterhood doesn't translate to that level of engagement, I think that's a pitfall. So we keep meeting, we keep talking, and we keep empowering each other. Um, but it, if, if it does just, if it stops there, I think that's a real, I, and, and that's something that I really worry about. I want to see women in my communities take on that responsibility. And then to show, to, to create a different form of leadership. Well, you know, we have a problem with, with the way we uh, organize. So we'll organize. And, you know, as women, we're very good at methodology. I don't know if it's because of the kind of work that we do. We like to talk about systems. We like to talk about processes. So let's do that. Let's, how do you, how do you organize and how do you, pro and then bring in our male colleagues and lead together. So um, my frustration with sisterhood <laughs> has often been that, that it, t it tends to stop there. So how do we, like, it's not just about like women's issues, so. That's a great point. Uh, men, I think, particularly in religious communities, for us to, us women, to further ourselves, men must be involved. Um, whether we like it or not, these are communities where women are identified by their men. Um, mm -hmm. And we, yeah, that needs to be changed, but we need to include the quote unquote establishment, uh, see how much we can push from within. I, I strongly believe that there is, there is room to push from within that establishment, from within that, uh, the kind of core of faith communities. And if that means that, you know, we have to kind of gain acceptance within mm -hmm. there, that's okay. Um, I, you know, once, once we get them on board, I feel like that, that, that will be the moment when things will change. Right, and I, and I think for a lot of women who work in, in certain areas, power is a really uncomfortable topic. We're almost allergic to power. I and mean, we think of men, we think of power, we think that's negative. And then we try to organize differently. And I, I think that's a mistake. Not all power is bad. Change happens with power. We have, as women, we have to understand how to be comfortable with power and how to work with men in our communities. Um, so I think that, you know, oftentimes when we're talking about a sisterhood, it's an echo chamber and we're reinforcing some of the discomfort that we already have around power. So working in the, so, you know, first part of my career was working within the more traditional human rights, gender <coughs> rights field. And it wasn't until I started working with policymakers and just shifting the, 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 the why women or why equality around, not just because it's the right thing to do, but the effective thing to do. And how do we engage with power? So I think that it's you also know. about like the way we visualize power. So mm -hmm. like you you raise this point about how women often are seen as operational experts, mm -hmm. or we work on methodology and processes. We're behind the scenes. We make things happen in our communities. Whether it's a social event, whether it's you know planning some event at the mosque or synagogue or whatever, women are often driving those things. But what we don't see is a visualization of women actually standing at the pulpit, actually standing on stage, and actually speaking to our congregations. And so those things are both symbolic, but they're also very meaningful, because what we're saying to women, what we're saying to our sons and our daughters, and to everyone who is listening, is that it's okay for women to do all the work, and it's okay for men to take all the credit. And, and I think that 
when we do that, it's not just this e equality thing. It's actually, again, limiting the way we see power. And it's this very constrained, narrow definition of what it means to have an access power. And so we are, we're actually limiting the, the, uh, the potential for our communities. What could be a powerful way of talking about this, um, I actually found really uh, life-changing, I guess, is uh, one of actually Hartman Institute's uh, curriculum. I attended um, a gender equity seminar a few months back with the Hartman Institute. And what I found so brilliant about the seminar curriculum is that um, it looked at Jewish texts not through a gendered lens, but actually through simply talking about equity. How do, how, how do Jewish texts uh, understand equality? Uh, and I found that really powerful, especially coming from a, an orthodox place. Um, you know, maybe that's the way I can, bring, I can talk about this. Maybe I can take, let's take the man and woman stuff out of here. You know, I'm not talking about men and women. I'm not talking about the F word. I'm talking about equality between castes within the community, you know, between different, maybe wealth class, you know, wealth, the wealthy and the poor. This isn't about gender. Uh, and I found, I think that's a, a brilliant and creative way of talking about it uh, mm -hmm. in places that might not necessarily be so friendly to the idea. You guys can all take that Hartman class if you're interested. It is available online. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to just uh, turn now to our last like formal question that we uh, wanted to make sure that we raise, and then we're going to turn it to the audience. And that is um, how you understand leadership opportunities right now for feminists of faith in the public sphere, in the religious communal sphere, um, and how those opportunities at this time are new, the same, different, and I'll just tell if you would start with that. Okay, this is a tough one. Um, I'm, af I'm afraid that there, the opportunities are pretty limited for where I am right now. Um, as a wife of an Orthodox rabbi, I see a huge, uh, a real a gap in, in not just leadership, but also just in, in my interaction with congregants. Uh, I see that, you know, half of my, half of the community is seeking a feminine role model. You know, it's not even about feminism at this point. They're just looking for a woman role model, a woman to be educating them. They want a female connection to spirituality. Uh, and that does not exist. And that was traditionally for centuries was the job of a rabbi's wife, but a rabbi's wife may not fit the bill. Uh, even if she does fit the bill based on her knowledge and on her personality, she's certainly uncompensated for it. So, um, you know, it's a real, it's a real problem that is, that is, uh, that is facing at least my community as I see it. Um, and to be very frank, I'm shocked that uh, the leadership does not see this as a problem given how much we hear about the future of the mothers of Israel. We hear so much about this. You are the mothers of Israel. Well, you know, who is inspiring them? Who is educating them, right? When you're uneducated, when women are not being taught, you know, the majority of the texts that make up our tradition, you know, we're left powerless and that's deliberate, right? So right now I don't see, um, I don't see a, uh, a, any major opportunities. I am hearing of rumblings within uh, the Orthodox mainstream Orthodox rabbinate talking about uh, female educator positions within uh, within congregations, which are which are paid roles where, where women who are extremely learned can take that learning, can take that knowledge. Perhaps it can become. Someone mentioned to me a doctorate of divinity. Maybe we can make it. You know, we can title it as that. But within the mainstream Orthodox community, I'm not talking about you know Orthodox women rabbis. That's another. Uh, whole movement, but within, let's say, the majority, there is, you know, there's there are rumblings of this, but it is um, it is yet to be seen. I would love to see something happen. Um, whatever it is, there is a major gap and um, a need, and I think that the leadership is should be held accountable for it. Um, you know, I think. Frankly, we are living in a really scary time to be a woman in the United States. Uh, we've just elected a president who has spoken openly about sexual assault, um, himself participating in sexual assault, and it just didn't matter. It was bottom shelf. And I don't know how we get around that as women. I think, you know, I don't know how I see myself um, as a woman safe in this country when that we've been told by 
it just doesn't matter. It didn't even affect the presidency. So that being said, I think the other thing that comes to me about when we talk about leadership is, is not so much about being able to occupy positions of leadership, although that matters and it matters hugely, um, but it's more, again, back to this idea of what are the lived realities of women in our country and in our communities. If women are not able to make choices about their reproductive health, what, I can't even talk about leadership right now. If women don't have access to be able to have, to, to live safe lives and to be, uh, you know, not living in societies where violence against women affects more than 25% of women. If we're living in societies where you can't even have health insurance, you can't have, you can't live, uh, but be a part of the labor force without being part of, you know, having three part-time jobs and staying awake, you don't have access to childcare. What are we talking about? And so again, I think leadership matters, but in as only if that leadership is answering the questions of the majority of women. Absolutely, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think that bringing up the presidency and, you know, I think it, in, a, in a way it's a, like a 9-11 moment for several Muslim communities, not all, I mean, I, you know, we talk about the misogyny and the racism that we're seeing flourishing. You know, we, we talk to our black brothers and sisters and other vulnerable community members. That's always been the case. We just see the more space for these um, ugly ideas to bloom. But, you know, I have a lot of anxiety and the role that I see women of faith is to, is to play that connector role, right? There, there was a knee-jerk reaction after 9-11 and pre predominantly male leadership rallied to the really important issues, civil rights and registration and foreign policy and racial profiling and all that's really important it will continue to be important but what we what, the issues that weren't being raised that were connected to these deep issues like for example domestic violence we know when there is pressure in a community that pressure on families builds and domestic violence tends to increase what we also know in these difficult times call women calling for help decreases because there are there are victims of racial profiling too. So there are women and children and homes who are being more abused. They're more at risk, but they're calling less, right? That was not on the agenda. I was, I would, I was part of these um, round table, these monthly round tables at DOJ where all these uh, heads of these community members would come and talk about these issues and making that point. And I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about these big issues. Of course, they're important. But how do we connect all the other vulnerable community members and making that point that this is a priority, domestic violence issues was a priority because of the large of the other parties as well. It was really hard. And the pushback was, well, you know, that's always the case. There will always be violence against women. Uh, but right now we have really important, we have a war against Islam. You know, and it's like, and I think that happens in all communities. And of course it does. And and, that, and I'm really worried about that happening again. Um, I hope we've learned our lesson. And I think here is what the reason that women will highlight these issues, again, it's not because they're better people, it's because they live different realities. They have different bodies, right? You walk down the street, you have a different experience of what it means to be a woman when you're in a home. It, it, it's, you could be a leader in your outside, but you can be very marginalized in your home. You, you understand what that means. So I, I, the role that I want to see women of faith play is making those connections. And again, it'll just go to making our communities broadly safer um, and I think the violence issue is a really interesting one too because yeah. you know, when we talk about um, you know a lot of these kind of lone wolf situations what we're seeing increasingly is when we analyze the lives mm -hmm. of these uh, the, the people who are perpetrating these crimes um, often come from homes of abuse they've either been sexually abused they've been physically abused emotionally abused in many many instances and so when we don't bring this idea about gender and, and violence, against, violence against women and women yeah. to the conversation, to these tables, we're actually missing a huge piece about how do we address terrorism? How do we address security? Absolutely. How do we address keeping our community safe? And again, it just goes back to this thing of, do we really care about security or are we talking about something else? Right, right. I'll just jump in. I'm fascinated by both of what you are sharing um, and how different it is from my community experience in the wake of this election. Um, you know, I think, I don't know, the average person here probably doesn't uh, see this as much, but certainly in my community, the broader Orthodox community, um, especially among men, there is a shocking amount of support for the president-elect, um, which has mm -hmm. been really difficult to deal with. Um, 
as someone who's voted Republican previously, but totally went the other way now, I, it's been very, uh, very painful to see certain rhetoric being okay, both about other races and about women. Um, and as what I've been, I think, most shocked by was, um, you know, people saying, well, you know, there's this strange place where white nationalism becomes okay for Jews. Um, and I'm wondering if we have amnesia of some sort. Um, and, you know, and the more I hear, I think the most painful thing for me has been not hearing, not the men, but actually Orthodox women, um, mm. you know, who are not necessarily educated or worldly, um, talking very, you know, very excitedly about the fact that there's going to be a Passover Seder in the White House this year, um, which for them is a, is a victory. Um, so that has been really, <laughs> really difficult to see. Um, I think, you know, we're trying to, within their bunch of us who are really uh, upset about it and we're trying to change the conversation, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's such a starkly different response from the community that I see um, and I'm very concerned about gender roles in our community uh, sure. being, again, regressing. Um, again, you know, when we're going from a role, you know, forget about the fact that we saw Hillary Clinton lose. Um, I was at the David Center that night. <laughs> it was like seeing the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, and going from, and just forget about that, just the fact that we're seeing Michelle Obama leave and Melania taking her place. Um, I, I think there is, again, a trickle down effect and it will affect even the most religious and insular communities in the ways that they talk about gender um, and leadership and what is acceptable and what is not. It's fascinating to hear you talk about that because I think the parallel that I see within the Muslim community is it's almost like the opposite is that what we see many of our male leadership talking about is Islamophobia, which is a clearly um, a really, uh, it's, it's something that's making many of us feel really vulnerable in this moment. But what I don't see us talking about is the gendered way that people experience Islamophobia. Um, most victims of recent Islamophobic attempts are women. And we're not talking about the ways that women mm -hmm. are particularly vulnerable. And it's because we have men who are on CNN, men who are talking to policy leaders, men who are you know, leading our congregations and our responses to Islamophobia. And again, missing the boat in the ways that 52% of the population is experiencing it, and not just that, but that are disproportionately affected by sure. Islamophobia. Yeah. So right. yeah, we, we have the exact same thing. It's just, it's being played out in different yeah. ways. Very interesting. Yeah, and you know- And this will be our last question before we go to- Oh, questions. sure. Okay. The, the only one other thing that I want to add to this is that it, along with all of that, there is also this, um, like we understand that women have to step up, up, step up to the plate. And I think a lot of our male leaders may even be looking for female leadership to push the agenda. But also let's, let us let's just really ask ourselves, what are we asking women to do when we ask them to assume positions of leadership, both religion and politics? Let's not, let's not forget, and I would imagine it's similar in both of our communities, there's such tremendous resistance to women's leadership, especially when it comes from within a religious context. And that like we're seeing a really difficult times. And oftentimes what I feel is that we put women in a very small box, right? Like you have certain roles, responsibilities, and, you ha and then all of a sudden you're taking women out of this box and saying, now you have to lead. And all these really difficult issues. So, and of course we do have leadership within our community, but I think that you know, we also have to have a conversation about the support systems. And that we are, that women in communities across this country who are living in predominantly traditional conservative communities are going to experience tremendous resistance. So we have that expectation, but we also have to understand like what they're having, what, 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 you know, what, what they're up against. And I, I've seen women in other contexts really struggle with that. So I think it's building the capacity, but, but build, building the awareness, but also building the capacity. So you're just having to take a look, looking at the issue from, from you know, all perspectives. Okay, I'll be going to make one more comment. One more quick comment. Go. Sorry. Um, it's interesting you mentioned religion and politics because um, I, think, I, I think this is true from the Muslim community. You see a lot of, uh, you know, the, those women who are rising in politics or let's say in other industries and other fields, or, you know, there was a Hasidic woman who was just appointed a ju as a judge in, in Brooklyn, you know, where there is a certain amount of leeway in which we can rise as religious women, um, mm -hmm. you know, in whatever industry we decide to, to pursue. 
and this is especially uh, visible in Israel where you have very religious women in, in high positions of power uh, in secular power, but not religious power, yeah, right? Yeah. So right. we can be extremely educated, we can get a PhD, we, we can, you know, we can, we can become lawyers and doctors, yet we cannot Absolutely. become educated in our own religion, in our own texts, <laughs> yet our daughters are still told, you know, you're not really supposed to open a Talmud, you can look at a photocopy of it. Um, so it, it's, it's that cerebral, you know, there's that dissonance between the two, and, um, and that's really what's going to, um, I think, speak truth to power in our communities. Okay, so I want to open it up a little so you guys can participate in our conversation, which is most fascinating to me, so thank you. Um, if there are any questions, uh, we have a microphone in circle. Okay. I see a question. Yeah, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, Abital. The, the question with the Orthodox community accepting Trump, is there no pushback because he has Steve Bannon as his... Uh, closest advisor. You mean, is there pushback to the fact that Steve Bannon is his closest advisor? In the Orthodox community. Yeah. And do you want, do you want to like insert in any way is that related maybe to our conversation about gender or women? <laughs> well, the women are also uh -huh. accepting it because they're happy that there's going to be a Seder, as they said, in the White House. Okay. Do they even know about Steve Bannon? You mentioned some are uneducated. Yes, but that's fake news, right? That's all fake. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there is, I will tell you, there is very little pushback. Um, you know, even Alan Dershowitz, whom I extremely respect, he's a congregant, you know, has defended him. So there's, there's a lot of, um, there is, there, I'm sorry, there's, there's very little pushback uh, about him. There's a lot of uh, suspicion of whether this is true, of whether he is truly anti-Semitic. Um, but I think this comes from a, I'm trying to analyze it, and I have different theories as to why this is the way it is. I've written about this, why the Orthodox community supported President-elect. Um, part of me wonders if this is a, an old shtetl diaspora Jew in us who must bow to the Tsar, um, accept whoever is leading us. Uh, and the truth is we have historically prayed, uh, it's very interesting in the prayer book, there's a prayer for the government in which we reside um, and if you look at old a Russian prayer books from the 19th century, you will know that there's a prayer for the Tsar, the same Tsar who is ordering pogroms. Um, and there is, a, there is a commentary in the prayer book that says that we are obligated to pray for the government in which we reside, even if it is Nebuchadnezzar, even if it is the, the emperor who, who destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem. So the commentary, what it is slightly doing, this is from the 19th century, what it is slightly doing, it is uh, you know, implying, well, the Tsar is pretty much just as bad as Nebuchadnezzar, but we still have to pray for him. Um, so, you know, there is, there is very much that mentality that we accept uh, the leadership under which we reside. Um, I think that is one. I think the second piece is that, uh, again, I think, I, at Ariel, we may disagree on this. I, we, we identify as white, um, and uh, it, many, I think most Jews do, and there is a uh, I, again, I think it's an amnesia of sorts that we, we don't remember that, well, we really aren't exactly. Richard Spencer, you know, is, is riling the troops across the country, and, um, and, there, and there's certain denial in my community about that. Uh, people don't want to hear it. They just don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about the Daily Stormer. They don't want to hear about the unsavory characters in this administration. I think we have time for one more question. Um, was it? Oh. Ah, hi. Hi, uh, my name is Shoshana. Am I holding it right? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I just, at two points. One point, I just wanted to say that um, I grew up Orthodox and um, I, I, in Israel and in, in America, um, I think that the, specifically the Orthodoxy that you're talking to is a, is one, one, I think, small uh, uh, piece of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy has many, many, many manifestations. And, and from what you're describing, that may exist in sort of your community. No, no disrespect. I just think it's important that we see, we don't think that Ju that is Jewish orthodoxy. I mean, when I was a child, my father taught me Talmud, and that was revolutionary. 
That's um, a great point. But by now, um, it's 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 pretty obvious from, and I'm I'm 49 years old, so you can do the math. But um, that there's plenty of of uh, opportunities for women to learn, and plenty of opportunities for women's leadership within orthodoxy. And in fact, in the orthodox communities that I live in, I I've never met one. I didn't meet one person who voted for Trump. On that, I would do so. So I just want to oh. say that there's, there's a bigger. It, it's a little broader. And just one other thing I want to say to this topic of sisterhood and to the topic of uh, that. Um, in in I yeah, I study comparative theology and law. And I'm so sorry. Can you frame it as a question? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Yeah, I okay. apologize, but we need you to do that. Okay, okay. sure, sure. Um, so, I guess my question is: um, Do you find that? Um, there are two realms. There's the realm of, say, say, mutual textual study and getting to know each other's traditions, and also the realm um, in which there's a sisterhood of helping each other in meta issues or in, in uh, uh, human quandaries of women, and that they both complement each other, or are they separate realms? I, I find that really actually hard, to, difficult to um, separate out, because I don't think we live in in distinct worlds. I think our worlds are always colliding, the spiritual, the actual, the physical, everything. And so I think whether you're thinking of it in micro ways of, you know, how do we work together on this very particular policy initiative, or more broadly in a, in a more macro sense of how do we improve the lot of women in the United States of America, I think that, you know, our spirituality clearly influences that and digging into our texts and understanding how we can pull out particular values and principles in our faith and perhaps see them in different ways. I think that's important. Um, but I don't know that we can separate that out so neatly. That would be amazing. I'd be very curious about how Muslim women read their text through feminist lens. Um, and I certainly think there's a lot of room to work together, actually to learn from one another and then take those learnings into our own communities about how they navigate within faith parameters. How do you get things done while still sticking to the traditions, while still accepting that there is a certain, yeah. there are certain limitations. Um, I would love to hear from Muslim women about how mm -hmm. they manage that. Yeah. Um, regarding your, your comment on the Orthodox community, that is certainly true, um, but I think it, that goes to show how fragmented our communities are. Um, you know, the people, those in Riverdale and Upper West Side aren't exactly talking to those in Flatbush and Barbwood, even though they're just a few miles away, right? Um, and the, the reality, you know, is that, that there is that there is that total divide, and um, certainly demographically speaking, the ultra orthodox community is is gaining a lot of steam. So, as a, as an activist and as a journalist, I find it extremely important to remain within that community and to keep a finger on my pulse and what is going on and the rhetoric that is going on within. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've uh, experienced great examples of specifically Muslim and Jewish women coming together to really talk about family law issues, for example. Right, and um, it's been a, this is one experience that I'm really thinking about. It, I, able to see Muslim women and Jewish women come together without a litmus test, be grounded in their faith on the values that our faith bring, and connecting over maybe not text but over tradition and our you know putting God into the conversation, and then finding concrete solutions. So, for example, both Muslim and Jewish women can often face an impediment to remarriage after divorce because of divorce laws. So not going into you know, a lot of details, but it's a very particular, what, what's interesting to me, it's a very particular American example. American Jewish women, American Muslim women coming to, to, together to talk about how our laws play out in American courts. Right? And Jewish women have been very, you know, uh, have actually figured out a great solution to, to having that impediment removed. And, that's something that we, we actually can do now in American courts and marriage contracts and have that as a clause and it's not then you know, um, religion and, and, and state, but it, not without its limitations. I think after a lot of, I've, what I, the experience that I had was, it was through, tech, we're, we're through tradition and religion that that relationship was built. Um, we were able to really address a concrete problem um, without a litmus test under a cross political divide. And that's the big issue, right? I think that for our communities overall, that becomes really the 5,000 pound elephant in the room. And um, that's, what, that's what I experienced. Like, as long as we didn't go near occupation, conflict, Middle East, we were fine. But I think it was healthier than broad, the broad dialogue that I've seen 
at least there was no litmus test to begin the dialogue, that we understood where we each stand on that topic, but we can come together as women of religion and as women that we were, we want to experience freedom in our private lives, in our family lives. And that, and then as, as long as we don't talk about that topic, we're fine. But as, and it's fascinating to yeah. me, like, on that topic is to when we, when we do come together, like, you know, I've worked on violence against women issues yeah. similarly. And um, I think one of the things that's interesting is that when you come together in those spaces is to say, who made that the 5,000 pound elephant? Why is right. the Israel-Palestine right. conflict the central issue, even when we're relating to each other? And I think when women, women have this amazing opportunity to actually perhaps make something else the center of how we relate right, to each other. Right. And a new answer. model, a yeah. really new model, something that may that may not be possible broadly, but that is happening and you know, and that's a model for the community. And that again is transcending from just a sisterhood to peoplehood. Okay. That <laughs> is a tremendous note for us to end on. I thank the <laughs> panelists Irfana, Abhi Pal, and Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, thank you.